Since we've gone to away from meat towards grains, what's been the effect? Less heart disease? Less obesity? When did the obesity epidemic really occur? Nah, 80s, 90s even. In fact, if you look over the last 15 years, that's when this obesity has really skyrocketed. Huge. Kids everywhere. What's that coincide with? The low fat, high carb craze. Because what does high carb do? Makes you fat. How do you make a cow fat? Feed it, feed it fat or feed it grain? Feed it grain. We live in a feedlot. We eat tons of grain full of omega-6 fatty acids and we don't exercise very much. Humans are the only mammal on earth ever that don't have to work to get food. You don't have to expend any calories to consume them. Do you? None. 24% of people in the Western world have zero physical activity a day. 24% have none. They don't count going to the fridge, I guess. None. None. So we're going to talk a little bit about nutrition, but I want to put that in context for you. So before we get to the solution, which is this, success leaves clues, and what did they do? They didn't, do, they didn't, they didn't break things down into minute little pieces. What they did was this, was that they, they learned from their parents and from their ancestors what was good to eat and what wasn't good to eat. They had a necessity where they had to have a lot of energy expenditure every day in order to survive. The average hunter-gatherer walked 10 miles a day. They didn't go on a walk because it was time to go for their walk. They just, the, the, the living, getting water, getting resources, gathering things, moving camp, whatever it was, the average was 10 miles a day. Not kilometers, 10 miles a day. That's the average, that's before anything, that's before the hunting, that's before the gathering, that's on average. And they, uh, we'll, we'll go over the, some of the other energy expenditure patterns that they had too. But what they really did was this. They lived in an environment which was what? Matched to their genome. They lived a genetically congruent lifestyle. So if we take hunter-gatherer humans and we make them live like us, do they get healthier or sicker? Do their genes change? When we took that, when Whitey Plague showed up here and we changed the way they ate, did their genes change? Because remember what happened, remember that first native that got obese when they started eating the white flour, white sugar, white bread, right? And they went into the white dude with the white coat, gave him a white pill, but the white dude's first question was, do your parents have this? And the answer was, no, actually in the history of my tribe for 25,000 years, we've never had a case of obesity or diabetes. And, the, and the, what, did the, what did the dude in the white coat say, or dudette? Oh, take this pill. And then that, that person's kid comes in, the next generation comes in, who's also done what? not ate the ancestral diet, been told that they're not a real citizen, all the crap that went on, right? I don't want to get into it too deeply, but we're scum. And so, then they come along and they say, oh, obesity, diabetes, do your parents have this? Yes, my parents have this. Mm-hmm, it's genetic. You have a genetic predisposition to this. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Family history doesn't mean genetic. If you want to do a family history, you have to go back at least 50 generations. Otherwise, it's what? You know what people in a family share? Habits. We share habits, and it's not just habits of what we eat, it's habits about how we deal with stress emotionally, how we deal with other people, how we, how we view ourselves, how we talk to ourselves, how do we talk inside our heads about ourselves and about others, what kind of community we develop, how we define success, all kinds of things. So the idea was when I started this about 25 years ago, what I realized was, wait a minute, you know, humans are really just wild animals living in captivity. I love Desmond Morris's line. He wrote the Naked Ape Great book. But he said, the city is not a concrete jungle. It's a human zoo. And that's true. What's really happened over the last, if we look at a couple hundred years, but let's just look over the last hundred years. Has heart, has heart disease gone up or down over the last hundred years? Way up. What about cancer? Obesity? Diabetes. Acid reflux. Depression. Anxiety. Crohn's disease. Fibromyalgia. What, have they all done this, yes or yes? How much have our genes changed in the last 100 years? Chronic illness rates, gene change. Chronic illness rates, gene change. So it makes perfect sense that they're telling you it's your genes. Does it? I don't get it. They don't say that about any other species on Earth. But how could they convince you that you're sick because of that? And what I find interesting is if you have a genetic illness, how could you ever get cured? If you have cancer, and they're telling you that the solution is chemotherapy and radiation, but it's a genetic illness, and chemotherapy and radiation don't change your gene code, how can you survive it? 
if you're predestined to have it because of your gene code and they don't change your gene code, how can it fix you? Is that a good question? I think it's a good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, if we ask the right questions, maybe we'll get the right answers, I think. Anyway, so what I discovered was that, wait a minute, humans are really what? We are wild animals living in captivity. So for me, the questions became quite easy. The questions were for me, you know, and, and as I got into the, to the, into the health field, what I realized was, my God, all we're doing is we're treating sickness all the time. All we're doing is looking at sick people and trying to give them a pill. We're never really addressing the cause of the problem. And then when I started to realize and, and gather all this data that, oh my God, there's absolutely no question that our genes haven't changed in the last hundred years, but our lifestyle has changed exponentially. And along with that change in lifestyle is all the increases in chronic illness and all the decreases in health and everything else. Then what really freaked me out was I started doing a lot of research and I started reading this research and they defined this. They go, we studied 25 healthy subjects. And do you know how they defined a healthy subject? This is literally what really freaks me out. They define a healthy subject as someone who doesn't have a diagnosed illness that they're studying. In other words, they don't define a healthy subject as someone who can do, you know, 20 pull-ups or 50 push-ups or run a mile in under three hours or looks in the mirror and says, I'm a wonderful person. How can I contribute to the world today? What am I grateful for today? You know, I love my community, my family. Or, you know, or someone who says, oh man, I just, you know, I can't wait to eat more raw fruits and vegetables when I get home. They don't, they don't, they don't do, do any of those things when they determine what a healthy subject is, do they? So every study is completely bogus because we, we don't know what they're studying. Everyone they're studying is a sick animal in captivity. So it makes sense. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy because if everybody you study is a wild human living in captivity, eating foods that are genetically incongruent and toxic and deficient in the nutrients they need, and they're under-exercised and they're sedentary and they're living in a very high-stress life and they don't have any sense of community. If every single person you study like, is like that, wouldn't you find out that most people were sick? And wouldn't that make you kind of that self-fulfilling prophecy that it must be genetic? The truth is there's two choices. You're either born genetically weak or you're born genetically capable. I'm here to tell you that you're born genetically capable and I can prove it. There's no evidence anywhere on earth that you're born genetically weak. There's no evidence anywhere on this planet, anywhere, anywhere that's valid that says that you're going to be sick with chronic illness, which kills 80% of us, because of your genes. None. And there's so much information on lifestyle, but guess what? It doesn't make any... If you, once you understand that what determines your quality and quantity of life is the choices you make regarding your lifestyle habits. It makes no sense to wait till you get sick and go get a pill because the pill can never work. What pill can fix a problem caused by an improper diet? What drug or surgery is ever gonna fix a problem caused by an improper diet? What drug or surgery is ever gonna fix a problem caused by not enough exercise? You don't even maybe understand it. Exercise is a required nutrient, no different than oxygen or vitamins or minerals. You're, you require as an organism the stimulation from exercise in order to express your genes in a way that's healthy. If we don't have a sense of community or self-esteem, what drug or surgery is going to fix that? All of the issues in your life, I mean, if you're really looking for the, for the source of the problems in your life, I always say, get a mirror. At the end of the day, what I want to help you with is to understand that it's your choices that determine your quality and quantity of life, not the genes you were born with.